And good evening. Welcome to our service. Please take your hymnal, turn to hymn 255 if you have that. Tonight we'll begin with grace greater than our sin, 255. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater encourage, challenge, and Lord, that we might continue to walk faithful with thee. We ask now, dear Father, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Good to have you with us tonight. Take your Bibles, if you would, Book of Acts. And we are in chapter 3 of the Book of Acts as we are just preaching through. And uh, again, Book of Acts, transitional book. Uh, it takes us from the Old Testament and the law, takes us into the New Testament and grace. And, and we see, again, that transition taking place. We see some of that tonight here in chapter 3. And just picking up 
Verse 1, uh, chapter 3, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. This is the second time they meet twice a day. Is, you know, they must meet. And again, here, this is 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 p.m. It's 9 and 3, but this is what they call the ninth hour. I know sometimes that's confusing. Uh, because we would say, oh, it's the ninth hour. Well, okay, that's nine o'clock. If they're meeting at nine in the morning and three in the afternoon. But that is not the way their time works. Their time starts at what would be our six o'clock. And so you add nine hours to that and you get 3 p.m. And so they are meeting here uh, for prayer being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him, and John said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Heavenly Father, God, bless your word tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning, again, point out very clearly who we're dealing with. We're dealing with Peter and John and the lame man. And so as Peter and John do what they normally would do when they are there, when they are in Jerusalem, they're going to go to the temple. They're going to go at this prayer time, at this prayer hour. And this is the ninth hour. So we know specifically even know the time frame in which this takes place. And this certain man, lame from his mother's womb, this is someone who has never walked. They have been lame since birth. They have never had the ability to take a single step in their entire life. And so this certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Now the gate beautiful is assumed, again, to be the eastern gate. And also as we get down a little bit further, it talks about them being Solomon's portrait is also east side. And so it makes sense. But again, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. So here he is, setting at the gate beautiful. He's waiting, he's looking for people that's come by, to will enter into the temple. Those who do, he is asking for alms. He's asking for money, silver and gold. He is seeking a way to support himself because he has no way of supporting himself. And so his parents have continued to carry him there. And at this point in time, he he's an adult. And so he's been taken there day after day after day. This is his life, sitting at the gate begging for alms. And so as they come by, he sees them, he asks an alms, and Peter fastens his eyes upon him, and John said, look on us. This is, is where the idea of faith, his faith and belief come into play, because there are other people, no doubt, going to the temple at this hour of the day. This is a prayer time. And so these men stop. He's expecting to receive something from them, silver and gold. And so they stop, these two men, and they don't just drop something uh, in his cup and move along. They stop. And again, Peter fastens his eyes upon him, looks directly at him, makes eye contact. And John says, look on us. The idea here and the structure here is don't pay attention to anybody else. Look at us. You need to fasten your attention on us. And he does. Well, here, here's someone who makes his living by, again, seeking on by all those who pass by. He now has two guys stop right in front of him, if you will, blocking anybody else. And they say, look at us. And then they go on and it says, and he gave heed unto them. He does exactly what they say. And he looks at them only. And so he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. He's expecting silver and gold. That's what he's there for. That's why he is asking alms. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. 
But such as I have, give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Now, immediately, this man's attention uh, might have strayed when he said, silver and gold have I none. That's not what he's looking for. I mean, he's not looking for anything other than what silver and gold. I don't just want to hear what people have to say. I want alms. I need alms for my support. But he continues to be fastened upon them. He continues to have absolute, complete, if you will, concentration on what they have to say. And so silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. He says this to a man who's never walked in his life. He says this to a cripple who's been crippled from his mother's womb. He says this to someone that what he is telling him to do is an absolute impossibility. This cannot, in any normal fashion, take place. But yet, when this happened, and he took him by the right hand, reaches out, takes his hand, lifts him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones receive strength. Listen, when he held out his hand, instead of sitting there saying, what's the matter with you? Are you guys crazy? I've never walked a step in my life. I can, I, are you being cruel to me? You know I can't. He didn't say any of those things. When the hand was extended, he reached out and he took the hand, and immediately, said he took him by the right hand, lifted him up. And that's, this has is, is been interesting to me. He reaches out, he takes his hand, he lifts him up. And only after he is lifted up, only after he has stood, it says immediately his feet and ankle bones receive strength. First he took the hand, faith, belief. And then he was lifted up, which is absolute impossibility. And then after he has taken that, after he has taken that step, as we like to say, that step of faith, then strength enters in. The ankle bones received strength, and he leaped up, stood, walked, entered in with them to the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. I mean, can you imagine the sight? Number one, can you imagine this lame man? Suddenly, he's standing on his own. Not only standing, but he's walking, he's leaping, he, he, he's praising God. Have you ever been around anybody who's had a broken leg or a broken arm? And it's been in a cast for a period of time, they haven't been able to use it, as he has never been able to use his legs. Muscles atrophy. No strength as here, they refer to it as bones. No strength whatsoever. Have you ever been around somebody who's just been in a cast for a few weeks? And they remove that cast? Can you imagine saying, okay, go ahead. It was their leg. Okay, go ahead and walk. Well, they fall on their face. They have to get very, very slowly. They have to work through these things. Already, even just after a few weeks, the muscles have started to atrophy. They started to get smaller. And they, and they started to lose strength. And the leg they've been using is still strong, but that leg that was broken and in a cast is weaker. Listen, they have to spend time, get that strength back before they can do these things. This lame man, and he leaped up, stood, walked, entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Number one, his excitement must have just been overwhelming. But then the reality of all those who were watching, they've seen him. He's been sitting at the gate beautiful pretty much his, his entire life where they could take him, set him, and he could ask for alms when he was old enough to do that. That has been his life. Everybody who regularly goes to the temple knows this man. They have seen him day after day after day. And if you have seen anyone with legs, arms, atrophied, there's nothing there. The muscles are, are, are gone. I mean, he had no muscles to do this, but now God has healed him. Jesus Christ of Nazareth has healed him. The bones are now strong. 
The muscles are now strong. Not only can he walk, but he can leap. And with his mouth, he praises God for what has just happened. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto them. Boy, they now say, boy, that, that which has happened, what? Unto him. But what, what is happening? How did this happen? Where did this come from? How could he stand? How could he walk? How could he leap? We know that that was impossible. We know that that could have never happened. We have watched him for years. What happened? How could this happen? How could this take place? It could take place by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so again, they knew that it was he. They recognized him. There was absolutely no doubt in their minds at all. Verse 11, And as the lame man which was healed by Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Okay, so where does this now bring them? Listen, this now brings them to Peter and John. It was Peter and John walk up. They talked to this young man, said, so we're gold have we none, but what we do have, we give unto thee. Rise and walk. Wow. What, what, what just happened? And as they watched this man now healed, they went, how did this happen? When did it happen? Who did this? And they are pointed then, what, to Peter and John. All the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. This was part of Solomon's temple that still was there. There's parts of that temple, Solomon's porch. And so they all ran to this area where they were. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people. And, and just, just quickly, I was going to mention this in the beginning. This is a purely Jewish crowd. Now, we've moved. Jesus has been crucified, dead, risen again, and also ascended up into heaven. We're past that, but still this is transitional. And as we're transitioning from the Old Testament to the New Testament, from pre-crucifixion to post-crucifixion, and all of these things are now happening, this is purely Jewish. They are doing this in the sight of the Jews at the temple. And of course, this is very important because the gospel was to go to the Jew first, and then the Gentile. And so right now, these things are happening at the temple. This is happening very, very shortly after Pentecost. Very shortly after they received the Holy Spirit of God. Within themselves, all believers receiving the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so Peter here saw it. He answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? When something, some marvelous, miraculous thing happened, they wanted to do what? They wanted to ascribe that to the people who did it. And they said, it wasn't of us. We didn't do this thing. You're looking upon us as though we healed him somehow. We did not. He goes on, the God of Abraham, right back to the Jew, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Boy, he points out, I said, wait a minute, the power to heal this man did not come from us. The power to heal this man. And he goes right back to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the God of our fathers, he says, hath glorified his son, Jesus Christ. So how did this happen? Where did the power come from? How, how, did, how did this man leap and walk? By the power given to them through the Son of God. Through he, who again is the Messiah of Israel. Through he who is the savior of the world. That is where this power, that is where this might has come from. 
And it goes on in verse 14. But ye denied the Holy One, speaking of Jesus, ye denied the Holy One and the just, he who did nothing wrong. He went about, remember the Bible says, Jesus went about doing good. He was a just man, a sinless man. And you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. You would rather Barabbas, a murderer, be released unto you instead of one who was holy and just before God. Well, I want to tell you what, this, this is, he is clear, he is in their face, if you will, and he is telling the truth. This is what you, Israel, have done. But she denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. We've seen it. We were there. We know him. We know who he was. We know all his miracles. We know everything that he accomplished while he walked this earth. You killed the prince of what? The prince of life. Jesus Christ is the prince of eternal life. He is the one to whom one must go through to be saved for time and eternity. And of course, the, the question so often has come up over the years, well, what about those before Jesus Christ? What about those before the cross? Were none of them saved? Of course they were. They were saved by faith in the plan of God. And God's ultimate plan included Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary as our sacrifice for sin, our payment, our, the taking care of our sin debt, and the allowing us to receive him as our personal Lord and Savior and have eternal life through his name. Amazing thing, again, that God did, that God accomplished through his son, the prince of life, the one who brought eternal life, whom God has raised from the dead. Listen, there's, there's never a question. He was dead. Never a question. And so the one who what, was raised from the dead, whereof? We are witnesses. We are witnesses to what? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 16, and his name through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know, yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Not only is he simply able to stand, this man is not standing and, and wobbly and, and unsure of himself. Uh, this tells us here that he has perfect soundness in the presence of you all. He is strong. He is standing upright. He not only can walk, he can leap. He can praise God. He can do things he, he never would have imagined prior, again, to the reception of the gift that was offered him by Peter and John. And now, brethren, I walked, and, and again, that, that idea of that, that word simply means I know. Okay, And now, brethren, I know that through ignorance ye did it. You crucified Christ through your ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all the prophets that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Always, we see this time and time again in the scriptures, as the scriptures said. Listen, the scriptures said this was going to happen. That Jesus was going to come, Jesus was going to be rejected, Jesus was going to be tortured, Jesus was going to be crucified, Jesus was going to die for our sins. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, wasn't just one prophet, all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he has so fulfilled. Just exactly as God said, God has done. And his son has paid our sin debt. Repent ye therefore. Boy, he, he immediately, he lays out the truth of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice that he made for sins, using again the miracle of giving this man, this lame man, the ability to walk and to leap and to praise God. And he immediately goes 
to repent ye therefore, be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Boy, listen, there is going to come a time when all the problems of this world, when everything that God has played, God's going to take care of sin. He's going to take care of the problems, if you will, of this world. There is going to be a time of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Listen, what side of this do you want to be on? I'll tell you what, I want to be on the side of the layman who believed when the hand was, was extended and he reached out and took that hand and was told to stand. He didn't tell him he couldn't do it. He stood. My friend, when by, by Christ Jesus and his sacrifice, salvation is handed out to us, we simply need to reach out and take hold and not doubt. Not come up with those reasons. You know I can't do this. You know the sin that's in my life. Or nobody understands the sin that's in my life. I can't be saved. No. Yes, you can. The hand's extended. All we need to do is reach out and take that hand of Jesus Christ and stand. Stand in Jesus Christ. Receive him as personal Lord and Savior. Do exactly what was said here. Repent ye. Change your mind. Repentance is a change of mind. I have been rejecting Jesus Christ. I've been claiming that, that it's all wise fables. I've made whatever excuses I might be able to make as an unbeliever. But now it's time to repent. It's time to change your mind. It's time to say, you know what? I believe what the Word of God says. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he paid my sin debt. I want to be saved. And we repent of our sin. We change our mind. And so repent ye therefore. Be converted. Change from who you are to who God wants you to be. That's true conversion. We are changed from what we were to what God wants us to be. And, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Listen, completely taken away. No, the wonderful thing when God forgives us, as far as God is concerned, all those sins are gone. We worry about something we've done in the past. Listen, when God forgives, he forgives completely. The Bible says what? As far as the east is from the west, they're buried in the deepest sea. And it also says they're forever behind him. He can never turn and see them. Repent that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. My, to have that time, we will one day be with God in complete sinless perfection for eternity. Sin will be known no more. All of these things will be completely gone, completely wiped out. He shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Listen, exactly as God has said, here we are again, just like what was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of the restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. He continues to go back to the, all the holy prophets, these whom God empowered to, again, what, preach the word, to talk about the future, to tell Israel what was coming, that they had a Messiah who was coming. All of these things were done by those prophets. This restitution, uh, the idea here is restoration, where it says, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restoration. All things being restored as it was in perfection, in the beginning of creation. Of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. God is going to bring a prophet. And again, he goes on, verse 23, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet, 
shall be destroyed from among the people, yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. That prophet that is being spoken of here is Jesus Christ. He is the only one that is prophet, priest, and king. And this prophet, those who reject this prophet, shall be destroyed from among the people. As he goes on, verse 25, Ye are the children of the prophets. This, he's talking to Israel. Ye are the children of the prophets, and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. He said, Israel, this is from God. What you have witnessed today is simply from God to get your attention to draw you to the reality of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he has accomplished for you foretold to you by all the prophets. This should not surprise anyone. But of course it did. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers saying unto Abraham and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. So, you know, how is that? How is all the kindred, everyone of the earth, blessed through Israel? Because Jesus Christ came through Israel. And we are blessed with salvation to all who we believe. It matters not one's nationality. Lastly, verse 26, Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Listen, Jesus Christ, his sacrifice on the cross at Calvary can be a blessing to all, and as this says, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. In turning away everyone from their sin. If we listen to, believe in, follow Jesus Christ. Repent, as he says here, repent ye therefore, be converted. Get rid of that sin, repent of that sin, change your mind of the direction in which you're going, and be converted into that which God has called you to be. We have a wonderful God. God has given us a wonderful story. And this book of Acts carries out that transitional story from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And I, I always enjoy being in the book of Acts. And this chapter and the next and the next and the next is just a glorious outlaying of the truth, of the accomplishments of Jesus Christ through the power of God and the indwelling Holy Spirit working within men. Remember Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, give it to men. We have this wonderful indwelling Holy Spirit of God in all who believe. And is that same Holy Spirit working outside of unbelievers, convicting them of their sin, and truly drawing them to repentance? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, how we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Acts. Chapter 3, what a great chapter. I was just laid out how God uses the miraculous circumstance of this man, this lay man being healed, to then take that, turn it to Israel, point out by whose power Jesus Christ of Nazareth was this one healed, bringing them to the reality that they're the ones that crucified Jesus Christ, but then that Jesus Christ, the one that they crucified, is still holding out his hand, saying, come to repentance. Come to conversion. Be part of the family of God. God calls us. Jesus Christ pays our debt. The Holy Spirit draws us unto salvation. My friend, if you're listening tonight and you do not know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, God just simply says in his word, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our hearts that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With a heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Ah, repent.
going to be converted. God called you to do it. Jesus Christ has paid the price. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this time we've had together. And we thank you for it all. In Jesus' name.